It's one of my favorite things and it gets overlooked a lot. First John will talk about that the way we love each other is directly connected to our understanding of who he is and how we worship, that the two have to kind of work together. And I love watching, I think it's the evidence of a healthy family when you can't shut them up because they want to talk. I think it's, a, it's just a fun thing to watch. Um, man, wasn't that so sweet this morning? Just, uh, I, I don't love making big declarations about stuff other than it just felt like we got invited into something that was so, so sweet and um, super fun, proud of the team. Wherever you are, they're probably debriefing and getting coffee. Good job, you guys. Um, hey, we want to dive into to James chapter 3 today. We left off... Um, we left off with a phrase, if, if you were with us all the way through 2020. Um, I had a phrase that I felt like I needed to stop saying, which is that I wanted to grab a big dumpster and light it on fire for 2020. Um, but I felt like the Lord led us into this, I, this, this statement that came out of one of the teachings, and it was almost an accident. And it was an accident that has stuck with me, and the, and the statement was, love with no room for regret. Out of James chapter three, out of where James has been teaching. Love with no room for regret. The deep challenge for me personally is what does it look like to become that kind of person to where I could say I'm living in relationships in the, with the world around me in a way that I've left no room for regret. I shared a little bit of my own journey with uh, losing uh, uh, of my father-in-law and having to ask myself that hard question, did I, did I love with no room for regret? Because how many know when the moment's gone, it's gone? And it was just such a, a, a deep challenge from the Lord that not all challenges from the Lord are sweet. It's not like he's always like, hey, you're awesome. Sometimes he's like, hey, buddy, I don't think you did that right. So I want to pick up in James 3 because we really looked at these, how many remember where we were at in James 3 where he talks about wisdom? He says, if you're wise and you understand God's ways in verse 13. And he uses a word here for wisdom, which is the Greek word sophos, and it, the word is, is to be understood, to have an intelligence about something, to have an expertise about something. In the first gathering, I I picked on one of our tech guys who, the guy running, running in front of house is Forrest, and Forrest is a, is a master craftsman woodworker. Uh, if you've ever seen any of the work that Forrest does, it's, it's embarrassing how good it is. Because I would say it this way, if you want a kitchen table, you want Forrest to make it, not Greg Sanders. Greg's going to grab two by fours, stain them dark, and put them together with screws, and it's going to be very utilitarian. Because I don't have expertise in this realm. I don't know what it looks like to have excellence in this realm. You want someone who is wise in woodworking to build that for you because they bring an intelligence and they bring an expertise, they bring an experience to the equation that changes the results. That's the word wisdom. Now here's the part that James teaches that it's important for us. James will say that there is a natural wisdom and there is a supernatural wisdom. And they are not the same thing. Our natural wisdom, I would say it this way, is, is the, the thing that rises up in us. It's our normal tendencies. It, it might be our, our experiences. It might be our expertise with, with people. In the business sector, those are called for so much the, the, to handle people with excellence and wisdom. And James just says, look, if it comes native to you, it's not God's wisdom. God's wisdom comes from God. The hard part for that is, for me at least, is that it seems so natural to want to function in the thing in my own wisdom. Because it feels right. If I'm in a situation, if I'm in a conflict, or I'm in a business situation, I want to lean into my own understanding. Anyone else do that? But doesn't the scripture say multiple places, trust in the Lord with all your heart, do not lean to your own understanding? There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end is what? Destruction. It's not that we're to live in fear of ourselves, it's that we're to understand that what has been placed before us, very much like what was placed in front of Joshua, is the Lord will say to Joshua, essentially, you have a choice. It's blessing or cursing. 
Joshua will turn around and lay it in front of the people. Blessing or cursing, choose life and be blessed. Choose what God wants. So James has been working through this process, and I'm going to read 13 through 16, and then I'll pick up in 17, and we'll start looking at that. If you're wise and you understand God's ways, live a life of steady goodness so that only good deeds will pour forth. We looked at this. That literally means not to do good deeds. It means your entire life is to become a good deed. And if you don't brag about the good you do, then you'll be truly wise. But if you are bitterly jealous and there's selfish ambition in your hearts, don't brag about being wise. That's the worst kind of lie. For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Push pause for a second. That tells me that jealousy and selfishness are man's kind of wisdom. They do come natural to us. None of us want to wear that moniker, I'm not jealous, I'm not selfish. But the truth is, when we looked at these words, it's this idea of using, and maybe even manipulating is a word that we could use, but figuring out how to use what's in us to get ahead. He just says, hey, that's not the way it works in the kingdom. That's not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are unspiritual, unspiritual, and catch this, they're motivated by the devil himself. For wherever there's jealousy and selfish ambition, there you'll find disorder and all kinds of evil. That's where we left off. Verse 17 says, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure. It is also peace-loving, gentle at all times, and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and good deeds. It shows no partiality and is always sincere, and those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of goodness. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure. This word pure here. It's rooted in the idea of holiness. It's clean or holy. The second definition is free of carnality. Free from carnality. Now, carnality is an odd word. Because if you you look up carnality, most of the original definitions will lead it into something sexual. But really, what the word that James is using means here is not merely human. So the wisdom that comes from God is, first of all, not human. Catch that for a second. I would say it this way. You can't get it from anywhere other than him. You're never going to walk in this wisdom based on your own instincts. This is a wisdom that must be gained from him, gathered from him, mined from him, if we could use that term. Holiness is a consecration term. If I say, this is Greg's water. It's been set apart for Greg. It's not yours. That violates COVID laws. It's not yours. It's been set apart. It's been been called out for me. Holiness is a term that means this very same thing. It is to to be set apart or called out for God's purpose. And it really deals with the question of whose desires or what desires are you living in response to? Are we living in response to ours or his? Are we living in response to the world's or his? So the implication here is that living from God's wisdom will require that I let go of my own desires, even maybe the desires of others, and instead let his desires become my filter for life. This is what it be, the, the meaning of living in God's wisdom. So every moment, every decision, Every thought now runs through the grid of, what do you want from me? For some of us, we feel like that's exhausting. Oh, it's so exhausting. I would just love to set in front of us the reality that, if allowed, the Lord will speak in to several things. He will lead us and guide us. Now, do I think you should ask the Lord what color socks to wear? No, I think that's ridiculous. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about those moments in life where where you're at a decision point. I'm going to do this. Paul will talk about it and say, be careful with that. Don't just assume. Instead, present these things to the Lord. All the way through the scriptures, there's this model given to us that says, look, I'm in relationship with him. He's working with me. We're together co-laboring to do this thing called life. But in order to do that, I as a person, man or woman, have to lay down the assumption that I'm getting to choose my own direction. And I begin to submit my life to him. 
And it's a, it, this is really a foundational root for us in developing what I would call a life of the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's the place where wisdom starts. The fear of the Lord simply is learning to submit your life to the, in, the desires of God. Those are, it's really easy to start with as you read the scriptures and you start living what you see here. But beyond that, there are lots of life decisions that the scriptures won't speak to. But his voice will, if he's allowed. And if we could just get this element settled in our hearts. If we could just become a people that would say, you remember those bracelets that they're kind of kitschy now, but they said WWJD? And it kind of lost its luster because it, it, was, it just was so franchised. But the principle was amazing that we live in this way where the constant question is, Jesus, what do you want right now? I don't want to ask the question, what would Jesus do? I want to ask the question, Jesus, what do you want me to do? What's in your heart right now? This situation I'm in, what's in your heart right now? This conflict I'm in, what do you want from me right now? This business decision, what do you want from me right now? Hey, I think I want to go here, Lord. What do you think? Nope, I want you to stay put. Okay, but I really want, I know, okay, great. It's all about learning to surrender to his voice. And if we can settle that, we start to naturally move into these, these God wisdoms. But if we, until we settle this issue, we're never going to move into those. The rest of the list is very interesting that James will talk about. The rest of the list that James talks about of God wisdoms all deal with interpersonal relationships. It deals with how we handle others. The first one he he uses is he says, the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure. It's also peace loving. This this word phrase, peace loving, means to be in pursuit of peace and harmony, wherein peace is the deposited result of your interactions. Think about that for a second. The concept of this word is that we're now living in pursuit of something in every encounter with people. I'm living to work to deposit the peace of God on my encounters with people. Not just the people in my home that I like, but with all of humanity. We're looking for managing towards and working towards peace. I think this word challenges our demeanor with others. It challenges how we present ourselves. It places the onus on me as an individual to find and work towards peace in relationships. Ensuring, think, think this through for a second, ensuring that I leave the peace of God on people after I've encountered them. And I don't mean have a really hard conversation, be like, hey, bless you, brother, peace on you, and walk away. That's not what James is talking about. James is talking about how we handle people, and it needs to become the mindset that we approach all of our relationships with. The mindset is, my goal here, after we've dealt with whatever we're dealing with, is that the peace of God is on your life. That your encounter with me netted the peace of God on you. I left a deposit on you. How do I deposit something I'm not walking in? And I believe this deals with our tendency, say ouch with me ahead of time. Okay, it deals with our tendency to stand our ground, to engage in conflict, to win a point, or to get our way. Because if winning or holding ground is a higher value to us than depositing the peace of God, we will never walk in this wisdom. Oy vey. (laughs) This wisdom requires I choose peace as a higher value than conflict. Anybody besides me, that doesn't come natural. I was built to argue. I believed I was programmed from the womb to win arguments. And so this choice is one that I'm either going to have to say, I think you're right and I'm wrong, or I'm going to say, I trust my instincts more than I trust you, God. I'm staying in my lane. That was a download from God. You better look at it. 
He goes on, he says, it's not just peace loving, it's gentle at all times. Say the phrase with me, at all times. What does that mean? It means at all times. It's gentle at all times. This word gentle here means mild in nature and reaction. Mild in reaction. Mild in nature. The root word is really interesting to consider. It means to be likely. Now I thought that's an odd thing, to be likely. And so I studied it and the teaching team and I worked through it a bit. And the idea is this, this word that I struggle with. It means to be agreeable. That's the root idea is to be agreeable. And I would say that's the core concept of gentleness because gentleness based on James' teaching is the natural outworking of a love for peace. If I love peace, I choose gentleness because it makes peace easier. And what it points us towards is a position or a posture with others. We're looking for agreement and we're making agreement easy. Anybody ever been that person that's really hard to agree with because you have to get your way? Clearly, this is a clinic for me only. <laughs> you say, well, if that's the case, then what about conflict? Could I suggest that we choose gentleness in our confrontation? Could I suggest that it's possible to have confrontation in a gentle, agreeable way? Could I suggest that our own insecurities cause a posture to happen that's not gentle? Perhaps we say it this way, that we choose to confront things in a way that doesn't feel confrontational. I am awful at this. For four weeks, I've stared at these two verses and went, I don't know how I'm going to teach this. Lord, this is so hard for me. My favorite TV show as a kid was Perry Mason. Anybody remember Perry Mason? How many in here, be honest, are way too young to even know who Perry Mason is? Okay, you guys remember Matlock? Still too young for that one? Yeah, okay. So Perry Mason was a lawyer. It was a black and white show. That's how old I am. It was a black and white show. It was right next to Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley. If you don't know any of those, you're too young for school. Perry Mason always won every argument. He always figured out a way to win every case. And I just patterned my life around this idea of I can win everything. <laughs> and see, James here says that's not God's wisdom. That's man's wisdom. I think this facet of being agreeable flies in the face of our culture more than any single thing James says here in three. Because we've been taught that living opposite to this is strength. The marketplace calls for it, demands it, pushes it. Church, here's where the rubber meets the road. At some moment in my life, I have to decide if I believe the scriptures more than I believe my own nature, my own instinct. Because there is a way that seems right to a man. But the Lord has taught us at the end is destruction. I promise if we begin to live this, there will be a, a certain mocking that happens in us. Because the culture around us is going to scoff. Why are you so soft? Why are you so agreeable? Why are you, why are you so easy for them to walk on? Uh, you know, I just think peace is more important. Everything about this makes me want to chew broken glass. It doesn't feel natural. It feels absolutely opposite. And that's what James is saying here is, look, if you're expecting this to rise up within you someday to where you want it, it's not going to work that way. This has to become a discipline of learning to draw these things from him and trust him. He goes on. I, this one gets worse. It's peace loving, gentle at all times, and willing to yield to others. The word here means compliant. James says the wisdom that comes from God is willing to yield to others. And it needs to be understood as being reasonable means it trusts others' motives, assuming the best, because it doesn't have to be right. Okay. 
These are wisdoms from God. That's how they're being presented in James. This is God's perspective on wisdom. This is God intelligence. Dr. J is one of the overseers in our culture. And Dr. J, when I'll reach out to him, we'll talk through life. He always asks me a question. Well, how has he handled you? Because that must become your model for handling others. How has he dealt with you? And I started thinking about this as I was preparing this teaching. I went, you know what? This is how he handles me. Think about the, the latitude God gives us and trusts us with. The craziness is that God taught 12 people the kingdom and turned them loose and said, I trust you, go spread this. He's not insecure, he's not a micromanager. If I was God, there would be a very short leash on everybody and it would get yanked all the time. But he doesn't do that, he trusts us. He believes the best in us. And this is what it means to be willing to yield. I think it's a wisdom of conflict. A wisdom of conflict. It governs how we manage moments of disagreement more than anything else. What do I mean? Wisdom, this wisdom understands that the bigger win is actually peace. It's not getting our way. Let me, let, me, let me break it down one step further. This wisdom understands that how people feel in and after a conflict with us is more important than the conflict itself. Now that one's tough, right? I'd state it this way, if you find yourself having to be right, if I find myself having to be right, fighting to win, and loving when others acquiesce to your point, you are not living in God's wisdom. You're living in human wisdom. I'm just gonna let that one simmer for a second. This teaching has been killing me. Because I never realized before that what James really says is, look, there's two choices and one of them's gonna feel totally right, but you got, if you wanna walk in God's, you gotta choose his. And he goes on and he adds a few more layers to it. He says, this God wisdom shows no partiality. That word here means it's unwilling to judge people for status. The phrase is very simple, meaning it's a constant willingness to see every person on earth as equal and worthy of God's love. It means we refuse to pander to people for position. It means we refuse to judge or look down upon people for prejudice. We see all people as equal. We treat all people as equal as the bigger issue. I'd say there's three things I, I would love to give to this. Number one, everyone gets my best. That's what James is talking about here. In this wisdom of God, everybody gets my best. I don't have some people I'll pour myself out for and others will be like, you don't matter. Everybody gets my best, because they're his. Everyone gets my Christ nature on display. There's not people that I choose to show Jesus to and others that I'm like, I don't care if you see Jesus. Everybody gets my Christ nature on display. And I am the same towards all people. We could say it this way, I am unwilling to live with hypocrisy. This is what James is talking about. And he, he goes on and says, it's always sincere. This wisdom is always sincere. This word phrase here means in honesty and gentleness with no disguise. In honesty with gentleness with an unwillingness to hide or disguise ourselves. The root idea here is the phrase unwavering. It means it doesn't change. It's constant. So this word speaks to how we are to live this way towards the world constantly. I don't know any other way to spell that except vulnerability. If I'm to present myself constantly in, in this wisdom that James is talking about, there's, there's no way to look at that except I'm living very, very exposed and vulnerable to the world around me. And the only way that works is if I trust the one who told me to live that way more than I'm afraid of getting hurt. I have to be willing to lay down my fear 
of getting hurt, my, my need to be right, and say, look, I'm just going to trust you because this is how you said to live, and I think you are right, and I am not. It's the only way this works. It means we embrace this constancy to the world around us as an obedience to him. We say, Lord, you told me to live this way, so I'm going to live this way. I love that James doesn't just, this is a tough teaching. And he doesn't just leave us there. He goes on in 18 and says, and those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of goodness. And so he adds this promise, if we will trust the king and live this way, he's gonna reward it. If we trust the king and live this way, he's gonna reward it. And he uses a farming metaphor, planting seeds, harvesting. So think about this, by living actively like this, choosing this wisdom, which means you're going to have to sit with the Lord regularly in moments of conflict, in decisions, just all the time. You're going to have to sit with the Lord and go, hey, this is what I want to do. What do you want me to do? This feels like the right course of action. What do you think? And give him voice into those things. Hey, Lord, this is what the scriptures say about how I should handle it. Here's how I want to handle it. I want to kick their teeth in. Scriptures say I should forgive them. What do you want? It means we have this discipline that we slow down our reaction process and say, I'm going to be under his authority. He's going to get to choose what I display. But he says, if you live this way, you are actually Farming actively for peace. You're planting seeds. Everywhere you go, whether it's at work, whether it's in the grocery store, whether it's at Target, everywhere you go, you're planting seed. You're you're putting the seeds of the peace of God into culture. Now, this is spiritual warfare, if we really think about it. If I'm out in guerrilla warfare style, I'm planting the peace of God into the culture, even though the way I'm living is super countercultural, and I I realize that they're going to make fun of me because it doesn't even make sense to them. But what I'm doing is I'm planting the peace of God into the culture. And his promise is that if we choose to do that and live in that wisdom instead of the one that comes natural, church, we're going to reap a harvest. A reward is coming to us. Now, we can't control when the harvest happens. But we can control the choice to plant seed. And the only way we're going to be able to plant that seed is if we make a decision. I'm going to choose his wisdom instead of what comes to me. For some of us, we have to make some hard decisions. Uh, David Mitchell, in one of his teachings a couple years ago, said sometimes we have to honor the brokenness that got us where we are. So maybe you've lived in human wisdom for a long time, and these things I've talked about as God wisdoms, you're like, I'm not doing those, those are crazy. I'd love to invite you to just look at it and go, man, Lord, you were so kind. You let me succeed really well. I felt really protected living that way. But I want this year to be different. I want to move into the wisdom of God. Because at the root of this is whether, really the question, do I trust him? Do I trust that living the way he says to live works? Or do I trust that living the way that seems right to me works? I used an analogy in the first gathering. If I want to go to Kansas, I'm going to go down 25 and I'm going to take a left at 70. Because if I go right on 70, I don't end up in Kansas. I end up in the ocean eventually. I end up in the mountains. The point is, we're never going to be able to get to this wisdom trying to follow our way and add God's way. We've got to make a wholesale leave of our own tendencies. We've got to let them go and say, all right, Lord, not because I want to. It doesn't even feel right. This is an absolute total faith jump. Handling this moment like this feels ridiculous, but I trust you to get that gut level honest with him and say, I don't want to do this. Jesus models that. I love it. It's my favorite point in the scripture where Jesus says, look, I don't want to do what you've asked me to do. But I love you more so your will be done. That is this whole thing, how we handle people. Can we be a people that have the courage to say, even though it doesn't feel right, 
I'm going to take a deep breath and model what you said to do, Lord, and I'm going to trust you with the results. Let's stand. Hey, if you're in here and you say, hey, this one's kind of, you know, hit me between the eyes. I'm, I need some prayer help with this one. We have teams. It'll be up here at the front to pray with you. They'll have lanyards on. But would you do something with me? Just put your hand on your heart. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Sometimes the scriptures are so hard, Lord. And sometimes they're so incisive because they just cut all the layers away and expose what's really going on inside of us. And Lord, there's an incredibly fearful thing just even in me right now to have the courage to lay down natural tendency and begin to choose your way. So Holy Spirit, this week, would you bring conviction? Would you bring a clarity of understanding to where maybe we've never even seen that we were doing it? Would you begin to I love David's prayer. He says, create in me a clean heart. That's our heart, Christ. You're creating us a clean heart. That we be a people that not just believe in you, but actually live like you and reflect you in how we deal with others. I'm so grateful for your grace. I'm so grateful for how gentle you are with us and how patient you are with us. We want to change this city by the way we live, not just by what we say. We want to change the city by how we handle the people in this city, not by just what we believe. So Holy Spirit, we need your, your help desperately for that. And we love you and we honor you. Thank you for today. Thank you for the sweetness of your presence. Thank you for the strength of the scriptures and the conviction of the word. May your face shine upon us this week. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, we'll be back here Wednesday night at 6.30 for our first gathering for next weekend. Prayers, 10 a.m. Tuesday. Much grace to you. Love you.